reason I started, we're going live, but um, the reason I started doing this is because one time I was outside of a comedy club, Jimmy Kimmel's here in Vegas, mm -hmm. and people kept coming up to the marquee and walking away. And they don't know who to go see, like if they haven't seen your special. And I thought, well, I think that the clubs should put little clips like this where people can actually get to know a little bit about you and decide, see a little of your comedy and find out a little bit about you from your own mouth. I thought these would be great, you know, for that. It just turned into where I just, people loved getting interviewed. So yeah. it hasn't gone anywhere. So. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, everybody, whether you're here at the moment, which is rare, or later. It's all yeah, good. Yes, today on Comic Spot, I got to mention my one and only paid sponsor. If you're a comedian or a housewife or an out-of-work plumber, whatever you are, if you want to learn or up your game in comedy, ahabroadway.org in New York City is also on Zoom and they can help you in improv, acting and stand up. So go take a look at it. It's a, it's a fine organization. They care about veterans of the military. Military and veterans get classes for $10 a class. That's almost free, almost. Yeah, yeah I'm Jewish and I know that's almost free. <laughs> so I don't know what your problem is. <laughs> Well, anyway, today here we have somebody who I call, a, excuse me, I'm not getting the cleft. I'm just having difficulty swallowing. <laughs> not, don't go there. Don't talk about that swallow. Now, listen, I got to tell you the intro that Drew Landry and the other square over there sent to me. Here we go. <laughs> He's our esteemed guest of the day. Drew Landry started doing comedy when he was 13. Do you know that's more than five of me today? <laughs> <laughs> and he went on tour with Carlos Mencia. Carlos Mencia. Most of us have never even seen a video of Carlos Mencia, especially <laughs> if you're younger. I've seen him. He's been on tour with him, you guys. Oh my gosh. Two weeks after graduating from high school, he did all this. He has also toured at, as an opening act for Eliza Schlesinger. Oh my gosh. This guy's been around some big names. <laughs> Landry created and wrote the humor section on the popular hip hop site, DJ Booth, and has also previously written for the college websites, Total Frat Move, and total sorority move. His articles on Medium have received a total of over 1 million views. I can't even turn ahead thanks to the Me Too movement. <laughs> Including his piece, I have a theory that Donald Glover and Childish Gambino, Childish Gambino are secretly the same person. Let me read that again. I have a theory that Donald Glover and Childish Gambino are secretly the same person. Now, I've never seen them in the same room together. I'm going to go with that. Mm -hmm. He was recently named one of the top 50 humor writers on Medium. Landry is currently doing mini tours in cities around the country. And now that he's tired of hearing about himself, let's get him <laughs> to talk about himself. <laughs> Hi. Hey, welcome. Funny, when you say uh, this uh, intro that Drew wrote, I'm like, now I'm going to look really arrogant. <laughs> you know why I do that? I do that so people that... don't think that I'm stealing your words. You yeah. know, like... <laughs> For those of you watching, she says, write a braggy intro. So I'm like, I'll make it as braggy as I can make it. And then she's, all right, I'll read this intro. Drew insisted on me reading. <laughs> Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I love to have people get out all the braggy stuff in the intro because it gives me a lot of room to joke around. Like, yeah. uh, I think I'm Martin Short, you know, when he does that parody of that uh, Jiminy Glick. Jiminy Glick. I love Jiminy Glick. <laughs> me too. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking your time. 
Where do yeah. you live, Drew? Uh, I live in LA, in the Valley. In the Valley? Yeah. Awesome. So tell me what's going on in the post-pandemic era in the Valley. How's life there right now? Um, well, it's scorching hot. <laughs> So that's been a whole thing, but, um, you know, things are kind of getting back to normal. Um, it's, you know, it's a weird time where like, you know, it's like this weird transition period where we're still wearing masks. We're still scared of Delta, but we can do things again. I mean, it's like that everywhere, not just in the Valley, obviously, but, um, comedy is mostly back. There's still some zoom shows, but in LA, live comedy is pretty much completely back. Some indoor shows have stopped because of Delta, but not a ton. Yeah. But yeah, it's kind of just like the rest of the country, just this um transition period. Yes. Oh my gosh. It's been something else. What was the hardest, weirdest, stupidest, scariest thing about the pandemic that you experienced or saw? That is a good question. I mean, the whole thing was so difficult and scary and stupid and hard but I think honestly and it's a boring um answer but just the isolation totally. just, just being inside and not around people I mean it makes you go insane yes. so I think it was that and obviously you know I missed comedy but I really just miss seeing my friends my family miss just going to a bar going to the movies just that a uh, year isolated like that you really go crazy yes I want to get into all the braggadocious things you put in your introduction <laughs> that I asked for in a minute. <laughs> but right now I want to go back to little Drew. Yeah. Who was little Drew growing up? Paint us a picture of you becoming funny and being told and encouraged that you're funny. Little Drew like was a, a class clown, but he was kind of shy. But I definitely, even when I was little, I wanted to be a comedian. When I was really little, I was really into SNL and I was obsessed with Chris Farley. We had like the SNL best of Chris Farley DVD. And that just made me want to be a comedian. So I was, I was a class clown in school, uh, in elementary school and middle school. Then in high school, for some reason, I got really shy. But I was already doing stand-up. So people in my high school would find out I did stand-up and they're like, that really shy, quiet kid who never says a word does stand up. Like it was, it, it was very weird. But yeah, little Drew was um, a very nervous kid, a very shy kid, but a very uh, enthusiastic kid. But yeah, I wanted to be a comedian uh, when I was little. I, I remember that specifically. I don't know why. It's just something I always um, thought seemed fun. Yes. And the very first time at age 13 that you got up, Mm. What was that like? Where did you go? Well, it, was, it was at the middle school talent show. I was in seventh grade and um, it was it was a big crowd for the first time doing stand up. It was like 200 people in this auditorium and I was terrified. Like I could have crapped my pants. I remember the act before me was this drummer doing a drum solo. So here's the drummer. Here I am on this side of the curtain waiting to go up and I'm just walking in a circle, pacing back and forth, sweating, hyperventilating. I mean, it was it was like that. It was like lose yourself. Like my palms were sweaty. My knees were weak. My arms were heavy. It was I was petrified. But then once I got on, I was still even if you watch the video, you can tell I'm nervous. I'm pacing around. I'm not looking at the crowd. But even then, it was so freaking fun that just in that moment I'm like okay yeah this is definitely what I want to do like I'm scared right now I'm nervous right now it's not going that well but I this is what I want to do I love doing this I can tell yes when you're on stage do you become like Beyonce become Sasha Fierce is there a little bit of an alternate personality that happens or a little bit I'd say like when I'm getting on stage, especially when it's for, you know, showing on open mic, it's almost like mentally you're like turning the switch where I'm still me, but it's a different version of me. So it's like, OK, time to turn into stage Drew. But I think uh, on stage, I'm essentially myself, but a very amplified version of myself. Love but it that. definitely is a different mode where mentally I'm like, OK, stage mode. You know what I mean? And I think that's yes. probably most comedians. Yes. What's the hardest thing for you to overcome to get yourself in the mood? Like, is it daily depression or like yeah. 
that's what it is for me. Some days yeah, for me, I'm just like, I'm not yeah. into it. For me, it's, uh, it can be depression. I'm bipolar. So that can make it difficult because sometimes you'll be depressed. You'll be exhausted in a bad mood, whatever. And you're just not feeling it. You're not, you're not in the mood to go on stage and go into stage mode and be goofy. And I think that can be really difficult. It's definitely possible to overcome. But yeah, I think that can be the most difficult thing where, you know, it's it's 1 p.m. You have a show at seven and you're just you just feel like crap. You're just not in the mood. You're like, I don't want to go be funny. I don't want to go be energetic. And like I said, it's it's very possible to overcome that. But I agree that can be really difficult. Yes. Okay, let's fast forward a little bit because you're 13, you're you're starting comedy. Now you're on the road with Carlos Nencia. Hello, what happened in between that hello and that goodbye? <laughs> <laughs> so I I started doing it at 13. Then from 13 to 16, I was only doing it like a few times a year because I could only do it like at talent shows or there was this local coffee shop where actually when I was 15, there was this local coffee shop where I would do the open mic every week and invite friends, but I wasn't doing it that frequently till I was 16. Okay. And then at 16, they started letting me into bars and comedy clubs as long as I, you know, obviously didn't drink. So, uh, and then at 16 is when I started doing it all the time. Fast forward to uh, when I was 17, I think, I'm at this comedy club. I was living in Baltimore, this comedy club called Magoobies and Carlos Mencia was there. This was like 2011. So this is, um, you know, after Carlos Mencia was at his peak and then had all that controversy, controversy and, you know, was all that stuff. Yes. But he was there and I performed at that club all the time. It was like my stomping ground. So someone told him like, there's this uh, 16, 17 year old that's doing stand up here all the time. And he thought that was crazy, a kid doing stand up. So he wanted to meet me. And then when he met me, he was like, Do you want to open for me tomorrow night in DC? And I'm like, Yeah, of course. <laughs> so I do the show, it went well. And I was going into my senior year of high school. And um, he said, That was, you killed it. When you graduate, I want to take you on the road with me. So fast forward, I, uh, I graduate and he just takes me on tour dates uh, on and off. Like we went to Ohio, Pittsburgh, New Jersey, just a bunch of random states. And yeah, it was a blast. It was my first exposure to traveling for comedy. It was, you know, these huge, huge crowds and uh, it was nerve wracking, but it was an absolute blast. What's it like off stage with Carlos Mencia? He is an interesting guy. Obviously, everyone knows the controversy. Everyone knows he was accused of uh, stealing material. And he kind of, uh, it's weird. He's kind of the first, people talk about cancel culture and that's whatever, that's its own thing. Yeah. But I, he's kind of the first celebrity from my lifetime that I remember being canceled. Do you know yes. what I mean? Yes, I like so the I way thought, you, I yeah. like the way you added from your lifetime, so I didn't correct you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I met him after he was, you know, canceled, and he was someone that um was kind of, and not to get too much into his business, but kind of wrestling with how hated he was. Yes, and, um, absolutely. How much of a pariah he was but in a way that was never bitter or pointing fingers he would he would say to me like drew he was the nicest he is the nicest guy but he's like drew at my peak i was a jerk like life humbled me i but don't he essentially told me that he was a cautionary tale and kind of encouraged me to not make the mistakes he did and to not He'd be like, at the peak of my fame, I was, I was mean to people. I was a bully, all this stuff. These are things he told me, not his words, but I, he's someone people still hate him, obviously. And he's someone I will always defend because he's done so much for me. And as for the plagiarism, I can't speak on that. I wasn't there, but I can just say the Mencia I know is a really, really great guy. And he didn't have to help me the way he did. And he's like, I consider him like my comedy dad. You know what I mean? So I'll, I'll always have great things to say about him. What's the best 
comedy advice he gave you about your jokes. Do you remember something oh, yeah. he said? Um, God, so many. Um, Cause he's a legend. I mean, I don't care really, about yeah. the controversy. We get too caught up in controversy. Yeah, I mean, at his peak, he like did stadiums. He was massive. But one thing I used to do, and this was 100% because of stage fright. Tell me if you've ever done this or seen this. Because I had stage fright, when I was on stage, I wouldn't look at the crowd. I'd look above them. So I'd be like, what's going on, everybody? And I thought they didn't notice. And he'd be like, you look over the crowd, and they totally notice. And then it, it feels too rehearsed. And that was another thing uh, that really changed my act. He said, don't rehearse your act. Because I would... Um, I love it. I yeah, love it. I would, I would, you know, be in my bedroom kind of rehearsing my act. Make it, he was like, when you rehearse it, it looks rehearsed and the crowd doesn't like that. You want to give the illusion that you're just hanging out with them and talking with it. So like have your jokes plan, write them. Like you don't have to go up there and improvise, but don't rehearse it. Just write the jokes and go up and do them and it will come off as much more real. And that was a huge thing for me. That made a huge difference with my act. So I think the, that was one of the best pieces of advice I got from him. I got some really good advice on those lines from a New York comic named Steve Marshall. He said, you're rehearsing too much. What you need to do is rehearse improperly, imperfectly. Yeah. And what, is the, what did he mean by that? Okay, so he's a boxer mm -hmm. and he, he will literally turn on the video camera and he puts a mattress on the wall and he boxes a mattress while he's saying his set incorrectly. He's not worried about if he gets every joke, if he says the punchline's correct. He's just saying things he recalls. Anything that comes to his wallet, he's boxing. He's like, you know, like, hey, I'm from the Upper West Side, not the good one, Upper West of the US map, Oregon, you know? Yeah. And you find by doing an emotion and not caring if you're correct, you'll find different ways to accentuate, like you're boxing really hard all of a sudden at the punchline. Yeah. And you don't care about if the words are correct. So new stuff comes to your mind. Real, that's really interesting, huh? Isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of like improv. For, um, no, it's like acting for stand up basics, you know, like the, yeah. one of the things they do. And ever since I've been practicing incorrectly, new stuff and I'm more relaxed and how I do you give myself practice incorrectly? how do you practice incorrectly like what's how do you do that so I go like usually my set is very like da, 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 da. Mm. and it sounds like that if you always practice it that way and it sounds over rehearsed so I would go hey how you guys do I don't care if it's perfect right hey yeah. how you guys doing um I know what you're thinking when you're looking at me. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Marilyn Monroe. I get it. I get it. It's causing a lot of fights. I get it. You know, like I'm adding. I'm not sticking with the setup and the punch. I'm going on and on. And then, but normally that would be, hey, I know what you're thinking. Is that mm -hmm. Marilyn Monroe? You yeah. Know? And then I just give myself room to play with the premise and add things and look in different directions, maybe do different body movements. Like, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll do that a little in that when I write jokes, I rarely physically write down jokes. I kind of, I write them down in my head, but sometimes when I'm having trouble with a joke, I'll kind of just say it out loud to myself and doing that for some reason gives me more ideas on what to say next. It you know does. what I mean? Just to, just to hear it and be like, oh, I could go in this direction. I could say this. Maybe it's funny if I say that. So I, I kind of do a version of that, but um, not, yeah, but I, I, should, I should try something like that more. That's really interesting. Yeah, you can even hit up Steve Marshall. He loves to help people at no charge. Oh, yeah. You can tell him, like Linda was telling me about this, help me understand it because I might not be the best to relay the information. Oh no, you relate it perfectly. Thank you. Yeah. Like, like I got all these jokes. There's like a hundred jokes. Oh and wow. Every, every day I pick one or two and I just meditate on one or two jokes to see whatever else might pop up about it. Yeah. Nice. So typically when I have a joke idea that's unfinished, I'll text it to myself. 
And then every few days I'll scroll through my text to myself and, you know, be like, oh, maybe this could be funny. Maybe this could be funny and kind of choose from there. Yes. There we go. So let me ask you, when it comes to your joke writing, mm -hmm. do you hear a word? Do you see a picture? What's your muse in life? What do you pull from to write a joke? Yeah, that's um, that's an interesting question. I guess there are a few things. Typically, it'll be just a random idea I get um, and I'll text it to myself or sometimes it'll be something that's happening. And while it's happening, I'll be like, there's a joke here and I'll text it to myself or just try to remember it. Or um, like this is this is an unfortunate example, but it's an example. So I, I'm working on a joke about um, funerals and I was getting a I was getting a suit, I was getting fitted for a suit for a funeral. And then while that was happening, I was just thinking of a bunch of jokes about funerals. So it, it'll kind of, I'll be doing something and then sometimes I'll come up with possible jokes about what's going on. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I think funerals, it makes me laugh to have somebody dare to try to make funerals funny. Because yeah. it's like, we shouldn't be laughing about it. It makes it even funnier. Exactly. And there's something, yeah, something that you, that you're not allowed to make funny just feels funnier. Do you know yes. what I mean? Yes. I like, um, I think it's funny how when someone dies, they become like that piece in this chess game that gets to the back of the board. And now you put another chess checkers. When you yeah. put another checker, now they can go anywhere because yeah. they hit the back of the board, you know, it's like, yeah, they've arrived. All of a sudden, they've gone from being ignored. It was grandpa. We yeah. saw him once a year at Christmas and he embarrassed us when he farted. And now he's a hero, you know, like yeah, there's exactly. so much. And funerals, it's interesting. I feel like funerals, they're great fodder for comedy because they're not supposed to be funny, but also death and grief it's so bizarre because there's no right or uh, wrong way to grieve so everyone's you're at a funeral you don't know should I cry is it okay that I'm crying I'm not crying is that okay um I just cracked a joke to my brother but not disrespectfully it's just that's how I you know funerals part of you doesn't know how to act because there's no right or wrong way to act and I feel like there's comedy there in a situation that's so sad and you yes. don't know, you don't know how you're allowed to react. And to me, there's, there's funny stuff there. And it's almost like, um, it'd be funny to have someone at your level contrast the difference of how you're supposed to act at a funeral. Is that like going to somebody's wedding? I mean, like yeah. the, the husband's family sits over here. It doesn't really matter. You know, like, do you go up and greet people afterwards is there a reception line or should you eat the cake yeah. or even like I remember a few years ago I was at a funeral for a friend and there were a lot of friends I hadn't seen in like five years and it's like what do you what do you say when you see them hey it's great to see you because like it's not because we're at a funeral but <laughs> things like that or like do I get excited when I see this friend I haven't seen in five years or should I not get excited because we're at a funeral how do I say it's great to see you even though we're here because he's dead do you know there's yes there's so many questions and to me there's there's so much uncomfortable great comedy there I have a friend I went to high school with and I should have known when I met her that she was going to be a class a b-i-t <laughs> and her mother passed away we hadn't talked since high school it's, I just had my 50th reunion right hmm. her mother passed away and I went to the memorial and there was Sally <laughs> and I'm like oh god I I get along with her sister just not Sally right and yeah. like, so like she's trying to figure out if she should use this opportunity to make amends before we both croak like her mother yeah. it's like so awkward uh, yeah. yeah see there's there's humor that, there's humor and awkward things and funerals by nature are awkward because grief is so awkward and confusing and yes. you're mixing grief and death with a uh, social occasion 
and it's a social occasion where you're not positive how to act and like objectively there's so much comedy there and the fact that it's not supposed to be funny makes it funnier you know what I mean and another thing that I think is funny about I guess Americans mm. is that we put these celebrities up on pedestals and when they get there we forget they're there and we forget about them mm. and then they die and then yeah. like wait a minute I remember you know this person at this stage and now they're gone what about we didn't get to grieve while they were alive yeah. how are we supposed to grieve when they're dead yeah it's all it's all very weird or I remember this is years ago at my uh at my grandpa's funeral me and my brother respectfully we love our grandpa but kept cracking jokes but just in a way where it's like this is this is how we grieve and you know he was very very old he lived a long life so you know it's not like but the fact that we felt like we couldn't be making jokes just made us laugh harder at each other's jokes because it's just like it's not okay that we're doing this and there's, there's just something so funny about that the way i see it it's like when you're a kid in in class and you're goofing around with your friend and they're making you laugh and you got to hold in your laughter the fact you got to hold in your laughter so you don't get in trouble makes you laugh harder it does and i think that it's that way with a lot of things in life that's gonna be a that's gonna be really funny i can't wait to hear that that could be a whole special yeah i know there's like i said there's so much humor with with funerals Yes, I just saw Ann crawling on my counter. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So you've toured with Carlos Mencia. We covered that. You've toured with Liza Schlesinger. What is she like? People want to know. She is so sweet. She's the nicest person. The way that happened is I was living in Baltimore. I lived in Baltimore till uh, 2015. Then I came to LA. But I opened for, there's this club in Baltimore called the Baltimore Comedy Factory which I just perform at a lot. And um, back in early 2014, they called me to just be the opener for a weekend. I'm like, yeah, and it's Elijah Schlesinger. And um, it's so funny because after the first show, she asked me to, to go on the road with her. But uh, the first, she asked me to go to Connecticut with her for a week of shows at this casino. And for some reason, I, I don't know if I was out of it or if I, I thought she was joking, you know? So yeah. she was just like, uh, so you want to come to Connecticut with me? And I was just like, yes, Andy. I was like, yeah, I'll come to Connecticut with you. Like, <laughs> and she was like, okay, it's March 15th, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, she's serious. She wants me to open for her in Connecticut. So that's how that started. Wow. Kind of out of nowhere. But yeah, she's so nice. She's given me good advice. And she's just a killer. She, she annihilates on stage. Obviously, Mencia does too. Yes. Yeah, Eliza's just blowing up. She's the best. Yeah, I, I also have nothing but good things to say about her. That's awesome to hear. So what are some goals you have in your life that you want to accomplish before you get to my age and kick the bucket? <laughs> you don't have to put it like that, but uh, <laughs> geez. Um, so many. Right now, I kind of, in my, I have a lot of goals, but I kind of lay them out in, in spurts, like first this goal, then when I accomplish that, I'll focus on this, then this, then this. So right now the goal, and I, I don't know if it could happen next year or in 10 years, but I the goal right now is to try to do late night, try to do like Kimmel or Fallon or Colbert or Conan's off the air, but one of those shows do stand up on one of those. So that's the goal right now. The goal after I accomplish that is to years after that, try to get a special. And, you know, it's just this series of goals. I, I don't know if I'll hit them. Fingers crossed, knock on wood, I could hit them, but Right now, specifically, it's late night and trying to work towards that. There so you that's, go. that's been the main focus. Oh, that's awesome. So let's say late night called you today. Do you <laughs> feel that? like okay, I'm going to call? <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like you have the material that would kill on late night today? I think so. It's you need five minutes of of clean material of tv clean which means like light pg-13 like you could say damn you could be suggestive but yeah i i think i i have that yeah super not yeah. the sound i the th here's what i've noticed tell me if you agree with this some someone um i can't remember who told this to me or where i heard this but i think it's so true every amazing comic thinks they're bad and every bad comic thinks they're amazing 
I think I agree. <laughs> yeah. But what's weird is then I get caught in this thing where I'm like, I feel like I'm ready for late night. But then I'm like, no, if I ask any terrible comic, I know they think they're ready for late night. Every terrible comic thinks they're ready to do Madison Square Garden tomorrow. And every really talented comic I know is always questioning themselves. So then I get caught in this weird loop like, oh, no, what if I'm one of the delusional guys and don't know? Because the fact that I say, yeah, I think I'm ready for late night. I'm like, maybe that means I'm not because maybe the people that are ready for late night would be. I don't know. I don't think I am. You know what I So it's this <laughs> weird loop of am I delusional? But then it gets deeper where I'm like, well, delusional people probably never ask if they're delusional. It's this big uh, loop. But the, the point is, I think I'm ready. But the fact that I say I think I'm ready might mean I'm not. So who who knows? <laughs> that's hysterical. That should be a whole bit. <laughs> yes, it, it's it's uh, that's my life. Constantly wondering if I'm delusional. If I'm, it's it's you know what I mean. It's <laughs> second, a swarm in here. Second guessing yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Most people won't admit they do that, and they do it. <laughs> well, what's bizarre is I consider myself a very confident person, but then the confidence will cause the self-doubt because I'll, I'll be feeling really confident about myself, about comedy, about whatever. But then I'm like, oh, man, all the most confident people I know shouldn't be. <laughs> so the more confident I feel, the more I doubt myself because I'm like, am I delusional for being confident? Do you know what I mean? It's like there's no winning because I'm either filled with self-doubt or I'm really confident, which causes self-doubt. So there's there's no winning. I love this. No, <laughs> I've never heard anybody talk about this. <laughs> you have now. <laughs> it's hysterical. <laughs> and it's, I think people can relate to that so well. I think so, yeah. That's Confidence is this double-edged sword where the more of it you have, the more you question if you're if you deserve to be so confident. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's so like so many people have confidence but are they a narcissist you know exactly. like are you a narcissist yeah. you don't like this you don't know yeah yeah so, so many uh narcissists not all but so many are such mediocre people do you know what i mean or it's yes. like i said i just have a theory the most confident people shouldn't be yeah so like, look at I hitler <laughs> exactly yeah he's i mean he was a confident guy there's a Michael Che joke about that. He's like, say what you want about Hitler. But like, he believed in himself. He had goals. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love, I love it when people speak about Hitler. You mm. know, I would rather they talk about that than be Holocaust deniers, you know? Yeah. So. With Hitler, they, there's comedy because he's the, when, when someone, if someone asks you who's the most evil person to ever live, obviously Hitler, like you don't even have to think about it. So for some reason, he's the example that we have of evil, the main example. If you want to give an example of someone, it's just pure evil. So yeah, that's why he ends up in so much comedy, ends yes. up referenced in so many jokes. Do you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. So where, as we're wrapping up, Drew, mm -hmm. where would you like people to follow you and what shows do you have coming that people can be aware of? Oh, good question. Well, you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram, and the username is just Mr. Drew Landry. Follow me on TikTok, which is just stand-up clips that I put up, and that's just Drew Landry. And I just put out, I don't want to call it an album because it's low audio quality and it's tracks from different locations just from my phone, so I call it a mixtape, but this comedy album slash mixtape called Calm Before the Storm, and you can get that for free on drewlandry.bandcamp.com. Drewlandry.bandcamp.com. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of shows, just a lot of stuff in LA. Let's see. I don't know. Well, I guess this will go up later today. So if you're in LA, um, this weekend I'll be at this place called Eno Vino. It's this wine bar. How do you spell that? Yeah, it's confusing. O E N O space V I N O. And that's on September 25th. Okay. On 29th, I'm doing stand up at a burlesque show, which sounds like it wouldn't go well, but it's always really fun. The crowds are always really just ready to laugh. But oh, they that's a hot thing to do. It's yeah. a great, great crowd. Yeah. Uh, but that's at this place in Santa Monica called Trip Santa Monica. 
And then on September 30th, I'll be at the LA Connection Comedy Theater. And those are all my September shows. There's some October ones. But okay. yeah, those are the ones I have coming up in the next week. Thank you. I'll put those on the post later. I have an interview Great. and then I'll put it on the post. And if I make any typical typos, just <laughs> let me know. Okay, I will. Thank you again for having me on. This has been so much fun. It's been so fun to get to know you. I love you so much. Thank you. And God bless your career. Thank you so much. Have a good day. I'll talk you to too. you later. Okay, bye.